Good morning, our viewers. Today is Saturday, April 20th, 2024. And we are here for our monthly distinguished lecture series. Once a month, we have a distinguished lecture by a domain expert. And today's domain expert is Ambassador Harshwardhan Shringla. Those of you joined using our flyer probably saw this flyer. The topic of today's distinguished lecture is India's G2 presidency and role in global affairs. I'm not going to give a long introduction. All of you know what Council of Strategic Affairs is, so we will not be going over that material. This is our distinguished speaker. Ambassador Harshwardhan Shringla. He was the chief coordinator of India's G2 presidency last year. Prior to this, he was India's 33rd foreign secretary. His working life began in private sector and then he moved on to public sector. He had management positions at Brook Bond India and later on in Air India before joining the foreign service. In 1984, he qualified for the elite Indian Foreign Services after ranking 15th in the UFPSC Combined Civil Services exam. In his almost four decade long diplomatic career, he served as India's ambassador to United States of America, to Thailand. He was India's High Commissioner in Bangladesh. He was also Council General of India in Durban, South Africa, and Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. He has worked on all major diplomatic geographies and issues during his long and distinguished career. His focus, however, has been on India's neighbors as head of the division in the Ministry of External Affairs and later on also as foreign secretary to the government of India. His experience of the neighborhood uh, important in the era of neighborhood first diplomacy is very extensive. He is an experienced multilateral diplomat, having worked on two Indian tenures on the United Nations Security Council. He served in the Indian mission in the United Nations in New York and also as permanent representative to UNESCAP in Bangkok. He has headed both the UN political and SARC divisions in headquarters. During his tenure as foreign secretary, he has managed key economic diplomatic initiatives, worked on overseas Indian issues and with the diaspora, and coordinated major evacuation and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, which I'm not going to go into detail. He dealt with some of the most pressing foreign policy issues, namely fallout of the COVID pandemic, India-China border issues at Ladakh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and military takeover in Myanmar. The highlights of his career include his key role in launching Sonali Adhyay in India-Bangladesh relations. He was a co-chair of India-Bangladesh Joint Working Group, which finalized the landmark in India-Bangladesh Land Boundary Agreement. He also organized a spectacular spectacular Howdy Modi event in Houston in which India's Prime Minister and United States President jointly addressed almost 50,000 people in a rare display of vitality and public support for India-US ties. He has addressed a wide range of institutions and interest groups including think tanks, okay. universities, business associations in India and abroad. He has written extensively for leading publications he has interest in conflict prevention, a subject which he has pursued a course at Columbia University. He has received the J.T. Gibson Award for Outstanding Alumni from his school, Mayo College, and was inducted into the Order of Illustrious Stephanians by his college, that is St. Stephen's College. He has an honorary DLIT degree from ICFAI University in Sikkim, he has avid interest in outdoors and in sports. He has interest in field hockey, having played at the university level. He has also undergone professional courses at the Nehru Institute of Mountaineering, 
Uttarkashi and participated in several mountaineering expeditions. So without further ado, I'll be handing over the platform to Ambassador Harshwardhan Stringla. My only request to is that please keep your cell phone on vibration mode, keep yourself muted. Please don't interrupt our esteemed speaker. All the questions have to be moderated and they have to be submitted through the chat function. Please send very precise functions. And just for information that we are recording this event, it's being simultaneously live streamed on our YouTube channel and it will be available in future as a resource. So without further ado, it's my indeed great pleasure and honor to welcome Ambassador Harshwardhan Shringla. Welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Namaskar. Uh, good evening. Good morning, actually, since most of our viewers have joined us from the United States. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Adityanji, uh, for the very kind introduction and for inviting me uh, to deliver this uh, address and to join you in this session. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, more by the names, actually. I see a lot of friends who have joined us, and it's wonderful to be reconnected. Um, First and foremost, uh, you know, many thanks to the Council for Strategic Affairs in Washington, D.C. for inviting me to speak on the subject of India's presidency of the G20 and India's role in global affairs. I mean, to some extent, the two are, uh, I would say, uh, you know, interlinked and coterminous, and I'll explain why. Uh, so, as all of us know, India assumed presidency of the G20 for the period from December 2022 to December 2023. In this one year period, uh, I think there were some very significant uh, diplomatic initiatives uh, uh, in keeping with the global situation. Uh, we, uh, it is widely perceived that uh, India's presidency was a highly successful one. It was a milestone in uh, diplomacy. It set a new benchmark uh, in multilateral diplomacy and the organization of uh, global events. And uh, to, uh, I think, for all intents and purposes, India's image and status in the global, uh, you know, global, uh, in global affairs and the image of our Prime Minister, uh, Sri Narendra Modi ji, uh, was greatly enhanced and became, I would say, uh, uh, very prominent uh, uh, on account of this uh, presidency. And I think we have to ask ourselves, uh, you know, um, why uh, this happened and how were we able to leverage this event uh, to, uh, I would say, in many senses, uh, um, provide us with the sort of uh, opportunity and role in global affairs that to a large extent had been denied to us in the past uh, 75 years. And to do this, I think I'll just try and place things in context, uh, both globally and in domestic terms uh, in India at the time that we were assuming the presidency of the G20. Now, uh, from India's perspective, uh, you know, this is the first time that we had become president or we were becoming president of the G20. Uh, this, as we all know, was is one of the most influential uh, global uh, groupings in the world, uh, consisting of developed countries like the United States, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, Australia, etc., but also including the up and coming emerging economies, uh, you know, whether it is uh, uh, India, uh, it is, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, it is uh, Indonesia, it is South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, etc., a range of countries, and of course, China and Russia are also members of G20. So it is very representative, but also some of the very large players in global terms that account for a disproportionate uh, percentage of global GDP, global trade, and global population. Uh, and especially at a time when institutions like uh, global institutions like the United Nations, uh, Bretton Woods institutions are losing their ability uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, find consensus on, on difficult issues of international concern, uh, the G20 increasingly is seen as a body that can actually uh, come in to, uh, to provide solutions where uh, other you know, organizations uh, are not able to do so because of the lack of representativeness largely. Um, in uh, in global terms, of course, uh, we all know that this is a very difficult time. We were just emerging from the COVID uh, 
pandemic. In fact, Indonesia that took over before us uh, had to do most of its meetings uh, in hybrid mode or in on virtual mode because uh, people were not, uh, you know, in a position to travel. Uh, we had the Ukraine conflict, which was a full-blown conflict uh, theater in, in the European theater, unimaginable uh, to many. Uh, and the impact that was happening, happening having uh, in global terms, in terms of the uh, rising inflation, uh, lowered levels of growth, but also acute shortages of uh, food, fuel, fertilizers. Um, in fact, uh, that led to indebtedness of many countries. Countries actually, even in our own neighborhood, we saw the instances of Sri Lanka, we saw the instances of Pakistan, Bangladesh uh, having severe balance of payments issues as a result. India was the one country that managed this very well. And I'm happy to, if anybody has a question on how we managed economically during this very difficult time when, when at least 70% of global economies were heading for indebtedness or already indebted, I think is, is a story by itself. So uh, I think we came out of, of uh, COVID in a, in a, as a resilient economy. Uh, we, of course, saw uh, the Ukraine conflict devastating uh, countries across the globe. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, within the G20, those fault lines uh, cut across the G20 between the, the G7 on the one hand, Russia and China on the other. You, not just have, you did not just have the traditional north-south divide in the G20, you had an east-west divide, which was also very acute. Uh, from our perspective, I think we were uh, definitely, uh, our economy was rebounding. We were already the fastest growing large economy in the world. Uh, we um, had, uh, I think, the good fortune of being, um, our Prime Minister was almost a permanent invitee to the to G7 meetings. We are part of the Quad, but at the same time, we are part of the a part of BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In other words, we straddle the ideological divide uh, in the world. I mean, very few countries can be uh, actually, uh, you know, um, in both or in, in multiple groupings of this nature, sometimes those groupings are inimical or, or mutually, incon you know, mutually sort of uh, uh, inconsistent with each other. And uh, our presence in all of these groupings, I think, uh, reinforced our ability to, uh, you know, walk that thin line and, uh, you know, collaborate with everyone uh, on a global basis. Um, so essentially, uh, a difficult time, but India was was uh, was doing well, uh, and it was a general feeling that when we took over the G20 presidency, that given the global challenges of the time, uh, if there was one country that could provide solutions to global challenges, it would be India. And I think that we did not disappoint. So coming down to what uh, what this really meant, uh, you know, in terms of uh, actual substance, if you look at the fact that our priority was to get consensus within the G20, a very, very difficult task, considering that every uh, text that emerged from the G20 was really, uh, I think, unacceptable to one party or the other, either the G7 or Russia and China. Uh, and consensus was very elusive. Uh, we needed uh, to get uh, countries to really deal with the challenges of the, challenges of the day, and mainly economic challenges. How do you deal with indebtedness? Uh, how do you deal with uh, the issue of supply and demand? Uh, how do you deal with, uh, you know, the, the uh, pressing problem of climate change? How do you provide momentum to the sustainable development goals? And how do you, of course, deal with the conflict that is inherent in the world and where the UN and the UN Security Council were deadlocked, unable to find a solution? And uh, in that situation, I think we stepped in. And as you saw on the political side of things, uh, Prime Minister's statement that this is not an era of war was very well received and I think uh, really uh, set the tone uh, for the way countries should collaborate. And if you also saw that we took a, a very, very calibrated decision and by we, I have to say that the vision, since I was a chief coordinator, I worked closely on the G20 related organizational issues. Uh, Prime Minister provided uh, the vision based on which we implemented his vision. In other words, uh, the thought process on how we deal with this came from him and uh, and uh, our of course task was to implement uh, uh, provide inputs of course we provided inputs but the prime minister definitely had his views and uh, in that context if you see our uh, you know india's theme g20 theme is vasudeva kutumbaka which is the world is one family you know um, one earth one family one future and that was very appropriate when you look at the ukraine conflict the conflict that beset the world 
uh, the sort of inequalities that were inherent in the economic order. I think the, the, we took a line that uh, traditionally, and in our own philosophy talks about the fact that, you know, the world is one family, we must cooperate, we must collaborate in order to sort out issues that are global in nature. If we don't work together, we will perish together. In other words, we need to come together to find solutions. And that also was well taken. One of the first things we did was we approached what we call the global south, the developing countries of the world. Even before we took on our presidency, we said, what is it that you believe that India should take up in the G20? Now, nobody had done that because everybody looked at it. You know, all those who took on the presidency looked at it from their point of view. This is what we want. This is what uh, we feel should be done. But India was the first country that went to the developing world. A prime minister held this Voice of Global South Summit in which he uh, engaged 150 leaders across the developing world, uh, sought their views and said that we will articulate the voice of the Global South. We will articulate your concerns in the G20 and we will bring a sort of balance to the G20 where it's not seen as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, club of powerful countries, a club of influential countries, but a grouping uh, that is alive to the concerns and, and uh, you know, uh, issues that beset the globe today, and a grouping that can provide solutions. And one thing I think we have seen is that if the G20 took decisions, those were implemented across the board. Because practically anyone who is involved in decision making is already within the G20. The UN is there, World Bank is there, IMF is there, OECD is there, African Union is there, ASEAN is there. So a uh, European Union is there. So I think it's really a very representative grouping. It may take time to form consensus, but if there is consensus, you have the ability to push those through on a global basis. Even the UN can't do that sort of, uh, I would say, uh, consensus building as the G20 has been able to do. So the Global South was our priority and uh, we engaged the Global South. We also said that we will use our own experiences, our development experiences, our successes, uh, which would provide which would be, could be seen as solutions for, for global problems. For example, digital public infrastructure. How did we level the playing field? How did we level the digital divide? How did we make sure that the poorest, the most underprivileged sections of our society are able to benefit from the digital revolution and digital India's uh, outreach? Uh, every uh, payment that the government had to make to those who are underprivileged, whether it is in terms of food subsidy, whether it's a LPG subsidy, whether it is for uh, work that you do under the National Rural uh, Employment Guarantee Scheme, any of the payments went under direct benefits transfer directly to the accounts of people uh, in our country. Uh, the Prime Minister pointed out that there are four and a half billion people in the world without uh, identity cards and, and there were over a billion people who are without uh, um, you know, uh, uh, bank accounts. Now, India has found solutions to that. India has found a solution to the fact that, uh, you know, we have provided bank accounts to the, what we call the unbankable, banking the unbankable, the bottom level of society that has no permanent address, that has no documentation. Those people have also got bank accounts. We have made sure that uh, digital um, uh, mode is used across the board. Uh, Prime Minister again pointed out uh, to the summit, G20 summit in Indonesia, that 40% of global digital transactions were accounted for by UPI alone. United Payment Interface of India, UPI is a system that we use for payments, uh, easy payments through our phones, through digital exchanges. And that system accounts for 40% of global transactions. So how do we provide solutions? I mean, you know, we can, given our experience and our uh, digital public infrastructure, which is open source in nature, that means we are not charging you money for it. We are not going to extract anything. If you want to avail of our experiences, you're welcome to do that. So how can those four and a half billion people who don't have identity cards get ID cards like our Aadhaar system? How can those billion people who don't have bank accounts take the example of India's banking the unbankable and you know, get accounts for themselves? How do we empower people in countries across the globe? So uh, that sort of thing is, I think, very, uh, was very critical. Uh, and we tried to provide uh, the world with solutions based on our own experiences. And that's a change, you see. I mean, I've spent most of my diplomatic life responding to initiatives from others. For a change, we are at the forefront of taking, you know, I would say, bringing initiatives. You know, Vasudeva Kutumbakram as a concept. The concept, Prime Minister's concept of lifestyle for environment. 
In other words, this entire concept of production and consumption and increased consumption is outmoded concept in today's day of sustainable development and climate change. You need solutions that are you know, sustainable in nature, that, that you live in more in harmony with nature as we've been doing in our country. Our consumption per capita consumption of energy is far lower uh, than countries across the globe. How do we do it and how countries all over should really look at a new way of uh, a new concept of lifestyle where you possibly consume less, you recycle more, and you deal with nature and deal with your surroundings in a way that is holistic. So, uh, you know, pro planet people, as the Prime Minister calls it. So, essentially, these are concepts that we took. The concept of millets. Millets is your superfood today in, in, in terms of climate change. But we've been using millets and consuming millets for centuries. It's a staple food all across India. How can we popularize millets? How can millets, you know, which needs less water, doesn't need uh, pesticides or fertilizer, is easy to grow, very nutritious. How can millets be popularized in the international year of the millets? All of these are examples that we took out uh, to the world through our G20 presidency. And as you saw that we were able to have a consensus document, an outcome document that countries across the world accept it. And you must also, uh, uh, just a little bit of detail from the summit is the fact that as we entered the summit, uh, there were countries that were still dithering, you know, whether they would agree to, uh, to an outcome document, uh, you know, there is a comma here and there's a word there we don't like, etc. And the prime minister at his level used his stature to say that here is a document most of us have agreed to it, and I am now tabling it. I presume all of us are fine, and every head of state and government agreed. Everybody signed on to the document. It was one of the most consensual documents and far-reaching in, in, its, in its scope and uh, recommendations that deal with issues like indebtedness, for example. How can we empower the Bretton Woods institutions, you know, the IMF and the World Bank? All of us know that they have functioned well in, in the uh, you know, first 50 years of their existence, but in the 21st century, their ability to deal with uh, issues such as indebtedness, provide more financing, uh, development financing, provide financing for climate change technology. Here they're coming short. And how can we empower them? How can we give them more resources? Those issues are the, are the ones that we have put across. And those solutions are inherent in that uh, outcome document that we have uh, adopted uh, in, uh, at our G20 presidency. Uh, one aspect that you have to know is organization. I think organization of our G20 presidency set a new benchmark, was recognized by countries across the world by being the finest and best organized G20 ever. And, you know, India has never been known for its organization in the past. The fact that we could host an event, a year-long event consisting of 200 meetings uh, across our country in a way that not a single thing uh, not a single issue or a, not a single incident came up to light, which is adverse in nature. The only issues that came up were those that were positive. The resonance from all of our delegates that were very positive was very noteworthy. But how did we organize this? And as, as the Prime Minister said, we took an event that is a G20 and made it, made it into a mass moment. It was very clear from the beginning that the Prime Minister said, we will not have this G20 event only in Delhi. Now, for those of us who are on this uh, on this uh, conversation, you would know that the only time we've hosted an international event in the past is 1983, at the time when I had, was just about joining service. I joined in 1984. In 1983, we hosted the NAM summit and we hosted the Commonwealth Heads of summit, Heads of uh, Government summit. Both those summits were one-day events. They were not. Uh, they were not, uh, and they were countries that uh, you know were numerous but not significant countries. To have the heads of state, the president and prime ministers of countries who were the most powerful countries in the world come to India at one time and hold, and we had a year-long event, which is 220 meetings over a period of one year, was quite extraordinary. And it was very clear from the beginning that we will not confine this event to Delhi alone, to the capital. Because for the people of India, what is it? He said, we have heard that one event is happening in the capital. capital mein. Uh, Delhi may, but we don't know what it is. Here, what we are doing is that we are taking this uh, this event to every part of our country. So every part of our country, every state, every union territory of India becomes a stakeholder. Every citizen in India becomes a stakeholder to the G20. 
So through Jan Bhagidari mode, which is basically a people-oriented mode, G20 was taken down to the grassroots levels. Uh, in the beginning, I remember our logo, uh, the logo as you've seen with the Lotus, and uh, that logo and the theme of Vasudeva Kutamakum, the G20 theme, um, you know, there, there was organization that asked us, can we use your logo? And we said, go ahead. But there came a time when the logo was everywhere. You know, auto rickshaw, people were using the logo, people in shopping malls were using the logo. Every Indian felt joined with it. I mean, every Indian felt that he was a part of this. So uh, that important thing is whether it's through festivals, whether it was through mass events, whether it's through education, whether it's through universities, schools, every possible measure through Jan Bhagidari was used to inform people of the G20, inform people of our presidency, inform people of our priorities, and every Indian became a part of that G20 exercise. And I was in Srinagar when one foreign journalist asked me, he said, how much, you know, I believe there are multinational companies that you are using your logo for their products. I said, that's true. He said, how much are you paying them to use it? So I said, it's the other way around. They're paying us to use our logo. I mean, they're not really paying us, but I'm saying that you know, these companies came to us and said, look, can we use this logo? I mean, it is so ubiquitous. It is so popular in your country that we want to use it for our product so that we, our product has better recognition and mileage it's associated with quality. So G20 became a people's event. It was taken to 60 cities in India, not just the main metropolitan cities, but tier two, tier three cities, cities across India, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from Kutch to Kohima. We took the G20 to places that had never, ever, done an important meeting, leave alone an international meeting. Take Srinagar, for example, you know, it was in my view, a game changer, G20 coming to Srinagar, 200 plus delegates, the UN countries across the world, countries that had in their advisories told their citizens not to go to Srinagar and to Kashmir. Those country rep top representatives were coming to that uh, city. A government did a huge drive in terms of the uh, smart cities program. And that was also unveiled at the time the G20 was coming up. So Srinagar was a chain city, transformed. The Dal Lake was super clean. You had this entire walk along the Jhelum, uh, which was which was world class. Uh, you had uh, you know markets that were completely you know with with all the wiring and all the sewerage, etc. Everything underground. It was completely transformative. And people of Srinagar and Jammu and Kashmir realized that here's the dividend of peace that we can have. Hundreds of, uh, you know, foreign delegates come down. Uh, we expect, uh, you know, later in 2023, we had 21 million tourists that went to uh, Jammu and Kashmir. So you can imagine the, the benefits uh, that accrued to uh, people in that state uh, through tourism alone. So there was, a, and there was not a single incident, no demonstration, no stone pelting, no adverse uh, notice, nothing. It was a game changer for Jammu and Kashmir. And across the country, whether it is my hometown of Darjeeling and Siliguri, whether it was in the Northeast, whether it was in Lakshadweep, or whether it was in Daman and Diu, we changed the infrastructure. We used the opportunity to get roads fixed, uh, pavements done, nice wall paintings done uh, along walls, which are you know, very unseemly, uh, lakes cleaned, rivers cleaned, essentially uh, created infrastructure in terms of conference facilities, hotels, and, and that infrastructure is not for the G20, it's for the future. So there was investment in the future. And I think the people were part of that, uh, that effort. And I think we involved, uh, you can say that India's G20 presidency was a highly inclusive exercise because we involved not only countries across the world. As you can see, we, we actually, perhaps our presidency had the maximum number of participants from Africa ever. And of course, uh, the crowning glory was when we, you know, Prime Minister Modi invited the African Union president and Africa, African Union to be a permanent member of the G20. That I think was, was our uh, salutation to the, to the uh, global South and Africa being, uh, you know, a continent that represented uh, in large part the, in, in the interests and the aspirations of the global South and involving them in the G20 in this integral manner was a tribute to our diplomacy, but but we had we had uh, as inclusive an exercise both outside in terms of the partners and participation, and within uh, within our country, you know, students, youth, uh, academics across the board uh, participated in a way that uh, G20 could have never envisaged. 
so it was it was uh, in many senses as i said it's a, it's a game changer and organizing uh, this uh, uh, i would say uh, event internally within our country was was quite extraordinary we focused on states we are a federal structure like the united states states are very important and each state had its own uh, its own uniqueness its own unique culture its own linguistic uh, aspects its own tourism priorities its own cuisine and each state was allowed to present those aspects of it and we presented the best of india uh, when we gave gifts we made sure that it was one district one product uh, you know which in other words which means that uh, those products that that, that district was famous for uh, we took them to tourism locations uh, we made sure that it was not just meeting with they saw india and they saw what india was all about and all that goodwill created through 200 meetings helped us in the summit uh, when a cumulative sense of goodwill came to the summit and they said, no, if we have to make India's presidency a success, uh, I have to share with you, I was having this conversation with the Prime Minister and he pointed out, he said, you know, this goodwill that we have accumulated through 200 meetings, you know, very warm welcome, Indian hospitality, our tradition, our culture, our food, I think people have overwhelmed. And at the end of it, it, it gave us very handsome dividends in terms of their willingness to work with us to provide outcomes that actually helped the world across the board. And when we handed over to Brazil, I think we handed over a presidency that uh, was, was uh, really very unique. And we gave them the baiting to take it forward. And it transformed G20, you know, from, as I said, from an organization that was seen as, as, as a prerogative of the powerful to one that is involved and integrally dealt with uh, the problems and, and issues that countries across the world face, especially the global south. And that I think was, was a very uh, significant change. And whether it is digital public infrastructure, IT hub in Bangalore, whether it was, we basically exposed the best of our economy, best of our technology, best of our culture, cuisine, et cetera. Now, what are the, I would say, uh, you know, outcomes that came out of this? And what is, what, what can we say were, were really the uh, you know final you know finer aspects of our outcomes and first and foremost I think it was an eye opener for the world the way India conducted its G20 presidency was an eye opener both in terms of the substance and the originality of thought and ideas that we brought in uh, these thoughts were not borrowed thoughts in the West these were our own original thoughts our own original concepts and those I think were the imprimatur if you see the final document it says that. Look at look at the issue of the Ukraine conflict under the under the chapter of people, planet, and prosperity. I think we brought in the issue of what the prime minister said. This is not an era of war. We brought in the concept of Vasudeva Kutumbakam as being the uh, I think overarching uh, uh, you know concept through which you can address conflicts of this nature. We also uh, I think uh, made it very clear that uh, you know. Sovereignty and territorial integrity of states cannot be compromised, with, but at the same time, you need to work through diplomacy, dialogue, and towards uh, peace uh, uh, and non-violence. The Prime Minister himself spoke to, has spoken on several occasions to President Putin and President Zelensky. Our doors are open and we are happy uh, to provide our good offices in any way uh, to facilitate any solutions to conflicts that are there. So it gave India a stature that we never had. I mean, we, our stature has been building up uh, very steadily, but it gave us an accelerated boost. Uh, Prime Minister, I think himself, uh, was seen as a world statesman, one uh, whose wisdom and views are sought after very much by, uh, by leaders across, across the globe. Uh, well, there is no major global issue today in which we are not consulted. We may not have the last word, but we are consulted on any issue. As I said, whether it's climate change, whether it's sustainability, whether it's conflict, whether it's food security, India is a part of any grouping that can provide solutions to global issues. Uh, the other, of course, fact was that it really transformed the way we thought in our own country. I mean, we after the Commonwealth uh, Games, which was a shambles, as we all remember, 2010, uh, it was embarrassing to see the way it was organized. After G20, it has given a renewed sense of confidence to Indians across our country. Uh, our citizens across our country feel that if we can do G20, we can do anything. In Mizoram, they were saying, look, we don't have any conference facilities. We don't have any place to keep. But all that was sorted out. Today, they have world-class conference facilities. They have the ability. And they'll say, look, if there's an international conference, please send it our way. 
So any part of our country can organize international events. And today we are ready to organize the Olympic Games in 1936. We are ready to organize the Climate Change Conference, uh, the COP33. As you know, the COP was held in Paris, it was held in Glasgow, it was held in uh, Dubai, but, uh, but we are ready to host it uh, uh, you know, in, in, in a few years' time. So we have the confidence today uh, to, to host any international event of any stature. Uh, collectively, we have, we have seen that we can rise to the occasion, and the leadership that has imbued in us this confidence is unmatched and unparalleled. Um, there's goodwill for India because of the uh, New Delhi Declaration. The G20, I think, feels that they have in India a friend, and India and the Prime Minister has this concept of Vishwa Bandhu, where we are regarded as a global friend. The, the Prime Minister's concept of working for human-centric development. You need Atma Nirvar Bharat to strengthen your domestic capacities, but you need those domestic capacities to be able to help the world in its time of need, whether it is vaccines during COVID-19, vaccine Maitri, which very few countries shared their indigenous vaccines to the extent that India did, not just vaccines, but also equipment and other aid during COVID, uh, whether it is digital public infrastructure, we are ready to help the world in its time of need. So we are come out of the country that today is not a global problem, but a solution to global problems. And that, I think, is a very, very vital difference. And uh, essentially, uh, you know, the world is taking note of us, whether it is in, uh, you know, whether it's our concept, as I said, of, uh, about uh, uh, the Vasudeva uh, Kutumbakam, the lifestyle for environment, and as we aspire to become a developed country, a Vixit Bharat by 2047, in our 100th anniversary, I think there is a renewed sense of optimism that we can do it. And with good leadership, good direction, and I would say uh, people's participation, we can achieve, I think, the impossible. So uh, I know it may not, it's, it's a very short time and it may not be as comprehensive as you might have expected, but we hope to deal with it, some of it in the Q&A. And Dr. Titanji, I'm very happy to, uh, you know, pass it to you and see if there are any questions that we have uh, from the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Harsh Shringla, for this first-hand account as you were the chief coordinator of G20. So we have this proverb from the horse's mouth. This is coming from the horse's mouth, first-hand account, the you know challenges of holding a summit that straddles across north-south divide as well as ideological divide in the entire global community. So hats off to you and three cheers for Ambassador Harsh Tringla for showing the leadership and diplomatic finesse in achieving the success that India claimed. So you have you share that success as the chief coordinator. Before I open to questions from the audience, I will have a couple of questions myself. You did mention that in order to have consensus, one had to work hard. But also there were attempts to derail and have an attitude that was obstructionist. And I will mention specific instances. A particular country objected to the use of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam as the logo for the G20. A particular country also objected to holding the meetings in Itanagar in Arunachal Pradesh. And that particular country was not represented by its head of state, who chose not to come. Would you share your insights and how you handled that kind of obstructionist attitude by this particular country? Well, yes, I mean, there, there's been a fair amount of media coverage uh, on the issue. But one has to remember that, you know, when you negotiate documents, uh, anything is possible. Uh, you know, uh, it's a consensus based uh, outcome. Uh, any one country can preclude uh, consensus. Uh, discussions go on from, uh, you know, from the beginning till the last moment till it's adopted. Nothing is done, it still is done. But one is, once it's done, it's done. So we tend, as multilateralists and uh, diplomats, we tend to look at the final product. And the final product has the consensus of everybody. I mean, you know, uh, whether it is the country in question, 
uh, that you pointed out, whether it is any other country that had any issue with any of this, they were part of that consensus in the document that came out finally. And in any negotiations, we are also difficult sometimes. You know, we, we, we also have many issues. We also have, but at the end of the day, what is the final product? And are you, are you stopping consensus? If this country had stopped consensus, I would have said, yes, there is a problem, you know. But uh, of course, I mean, there is no doubt that on certain areas, this country had issues and, and ideological issues and political issues, as you pointed out, in terms of participation in Itanagar. I was in Itanagar and, you know, I was, I was very happy to see so much participation uh, by countries across the G20. I was in Srinagar when we had countries, you know, even countries like uh, Turkey and, uh, you know, uh, countries that you didn't expect actually had participation, may not have had their government representatives, but their tourism industry was very much represented. It was a tourism meeting in Srinagar. And of course, uh, you may not have had the head of state, but you had the head of government. And it is, at the end of the day, a head of state slash head of government meeting. So, I mean, I, I, I am taking your point. I'm not, I'm just put, I'm putting it in context also. And certainly you have a point in what you're saying, Dr. Aditya Thank you, thank you. Uh, the G20 meeting that was held in the previous year in Indonesia was very peculiar in the sense that a head of state was invited, whereas the country was not member of G20 and that head of state was President Zelensky. And I think there was some initial inquiry or kind of expectation that he will be invited again. How did you handle that issue? Because it sets a pre precedent when you go beyond the agenda and start inviting people that are not part of it. Yes, I, I would agree with the use of the word peculiar. I think we all found it peculiar. Uh, the guest in question, uh, like everybody else, was to speak for three or five minutes, but he spoke for, I think, 30 or 40 minutes. The fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, India's presidency was not like other presidencies. We were very clear as to what we had to do, whom we had to invite, how we had to conduct our meetings, uh, what setting it should be done, and any country that didn't, uh, you know, uh, that had reservations about it uh, was convinced uh, I, I, otherwise. Uh, so, uh, I don't think we compromise on our priorities. We were the president, we were the host, and we would do what we want to. And uh, the entire presidency, as I said, had our imprint and ours only. Nobody told us in organizational terms, do this and do that. They might have tried, they might have suggested, they might have also lobbied. But uh, as far as we are concerned, we would host the summit exactly the way we want to. And today, uh, we are a nation on the move. We are a proud nation. We are a young nation. We are a successful nation. And we are not going to be, uh, I would say, um, definitely not going to compromise on how we want to conduct our own affairs, whether it's within our country or how we want to host events that involve others in our country. Uh, there is no compromise in that regard. There was some uh, concern President Putin did not attend the G20 meeting in person. He attended it virtually. And prior to that, there was some concern in South Africa when BRICS meeting was held there. And there was an issue that there will be an arrest warrant against President Putin. Uh, did that issue play in his possible non-attendance in person? Or that was a non-issue as far as India is concerned? Well, um, let me start with the second part of the question, because I think that's more uh, immediately relevant. We are, we are not, we are a country that has not ratified the International Criminal Court. We are not part of ICC judgments. Uh, we don't believe that we have any international obliga obligation to go by the judgment. In fact, we have, I, I suspect, and I'm only saying it in my personal capacity, we have serious reservations in the way this body is practicing its intrusive uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, uh, outreach or engagement with, with uh, countries across the world. Um, there is certainly a need for some international arbitration, uh, but not in a manner that uh, seems to be, um, uh, you know, the interpretation right now. And uh, certainly uh, there is under the Vienna Convention also a sense that heads of state government, etc., have a certain level of immunity. 
so certainly that aspect did not apply to us. If you can recall that when uh, we were hosting our summit, there were preoccupations that uh, President Putin had to deal with. I mean, he's fighting a war at the end of the day, uh, a conflict uh, within his own uh, you know, area. And for him to be uh, outside at that time, I imagine might have been difficult. Uh, he did not go to Indonesia. Uh, he did join us, as you said, virtually. So there are extenuating circumstances, and I think uh, we, in some extent, a uh, lot of countries can understand those circumstances uh, in that regard. But certainly, the ICC aspect, which applied to South Africa, uh, which, as you know, the, uh, it takes a certain uh, position uh, that is left of center and uh, extremely uh, liberal in the way it interprets, uh, you know, international uh, rules and obligations, and we don't necessarily always share uh, that uh, point of view. India took a leadership role in inviting African Union to G20 meeting as a new member. And in fact, the Prime Minister had given his assurance to a African Union representative in Indonesia itself that they will be invited and he kept his word. The question I have is, why didn't we change the name from G20 to G21? It was a golden opportunity to leave our permanent imprint by calling it G21. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes you say what's in a name, but uh, but you know the fact of the matter is it it was already G21 even before we took over because uh, you know the European Union is represented by two, uh, the European Council and the European Commission. Uh, there are 19 countries and one in one regional organization. There there is a certain level of ambiguity. And if you count those two, then you're already 21. If you count the African Union at 22. So, uh, you know, you can't keep changing the name. Uh, people are used to G20, then it becomes 21, 22. Uh, nobody has told me this. So this is my own uh, sense. But I think that issue was not germane. And since the African Union joined us at the summit right at the end, when we handed over the baton to Brazil, uh, that responsibility of changing names really rests with Brazil. It is not uh, with us because... When we took on the African Union, we were more or less, I think, sort of also completing our obligations and handing it over to Brazil. You will recall the same meeting, the baton was handed over to President Lula of Brazil. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience, and I will paraphrase them for the sake of brevity. And uh, the question is from Shrikant Chopra. Uh, can you point out some of the long-term financial and security benefits emanating from this extremely uh, well-run forum, that is G20. Maybe you should ask a few questions. Uh, I can then, you know, respond to say two or three, uh, Dr. Dengji. Okay, okay. The next question is, I would like to ask the panel after considering the significant potential for economic cooperation between India, Brazil, especially with it. So somebody is actually, uh, member of Brazil's B20 Trade and Investment Task Force and wants to know as a member of G20, how can he contribute personally to foster stronger economic ties between India and Brazil? So it's a very specific question that this person is in Brazil, part of some Brazil's B20 Trade and Investment Task Force and He's asking from you some advice how he can cooperate, uh, foster the cooperation between India and Brazil. Right. So uh, if you talk about financial and security benefits, of course, we have to understand that uh, although I spoke about political aspects, I spoke also about, uh, uh, you know, in some senses, uh, there is some level of security uh, related aspects in the G20. It is largely a financial and economic uh, body um but you can't avoid politics and you can't avoid some level of uh, strategic and security related aspects even in the g20 uh, on the financial side i think uh, you know what is very important was financial inclusion india worked very hard to uh, to uh, come up with some consensus on the issue of financial inclusion how can we empower countries, uh, you know, uh, in their efforts towards financial inclusion. Some of that I already mentioned in terms of direct benefit transfers, uh, in terms of how to use digital public infrastructure to empower citizens, 
Uh, we had a forum that uh, that enabled us in the G20 to invite countries, developing countries from across the world who participated in these meetings, basically to understand how we have uh, worked on financial inclusion. How, can, how have we succeeded in ensuring that we are reaching to the lowest level segment in our society and getting the benefits directly to him without any diversion and without any uh, inconvenience to him. And that is something that we're trying to share with citizens. So financial inclusion is very important spin-off benefit. And that group continues and India is chairing that uh, uh, you know, group on uh, financial inclusion, on a global financial inclusion. They're not just G20, but it's a G20 group that brings countries from all over the world, whether it is Mauritius or whether it is Latin America or whether it is Papua New Guinea, these countries come together and learn uh, from the G20 and essentially are empowered. We also have put in a process whereby uh, our digital public infrastructure paradigm is available and countries can benefit, benefit from it. Other G20 countries can also contribute to, uh, to this through their experiences. So financial inclusion is important and financial participation is important. Strengthening of multilateral financial institutions are very important. I did mention that there was an effort to ensure that uh, the Bretton Woods institutions are better resourced so they can address the challenges of the 21st century, whether it is indebtedness, whether it is finance, providing finance, uh, climate financing, uh, whether it can even provide financing to uh, mid-level developing countries in, in their endeavors. So a lot of thought has gone into that, and I think that is work in progress that will continue to strengthen as we go along. On the security side, uh, you know, there is there is an important uh, uh, aspect of some uh, amount of uh, consensus within the, within the G20 on issues such as uh, counterterrorism, cyber security, uh, on issues that involve money laundering. That's an important priority for us. Anti-corruption, money laundering, all of these areas, I think we have worked with our partners, and this is an area that we attach a lot of priority to. It's not a core G20 area, as I pointed out from the beginning, but it is one that we and many other countries believe is important, and we have tried to push it through the G20 agenda. Um, with the second question regarding the uh, you know B20 Trade and Investment Task Force, um, the uh, you have to understand the G20 is basically you know a re, is, is a grouping of countries. So any issues that they deal with are those that apply to very large number of countries, and uh, it is not a bilateral exercise. But the B20 does provide the forum where business people meet each other, uh, you know, across the G20. So Indian delegates will be going to Brazil. Uh, I myself know several Indian uh, members of the B20 task, uh, you know, task force on investment and trade, happy to put you in touch. And they will be more than happy to talk to you and see how they can, you know, you can bilaterally look at B2B ties between India and Brazil. I think that's very important. And uh, but it's not a G20, uh, how would you say, mandate. G20 is looking at it from a group's perspective, not from the perspective of two individual countries. Uh, there is a very specific question by Abhilasha Singh. <laughs> and, uh, basically, it is how does China's role evolve in G20 in the near future? Uh, Abhilasha ji, what I can say is that you know, like us, uh, China has also been a member of the G20 right from the beginning. Um, as I tried to hint earlier, they can, uh, I think, uh, have views and they can sort of take up issues uh, within the G20 that can in many senses be seen as, uh, as being, uh, you know, uh, going against the grain or being obstructive, but they are never the last, last man standing. In other words, they will never block consensus. So, uh, you know, they, they understand that in a multilateral setting, you don't, uh, you know, uh, sort of work as a spoiler. But that's, that's one aspect of it. I think the fact is that you are seeing greater, uh, you know, global uncertainty. The, uh, you know, issues between uh, the global West and, the, and uh, China and Russia, on the other hand, uh, you know, might accentuate over time. Um, and clearly, uh, this might uh, force countries into a certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, a sort of a re-enactment uh, of the Cold War again. Uh, I have to tell you that we don't want that. As far as we are concerned, we want a multipolar world with India as one of the poles. We don't want to see, we didn't want a bipolar world. 
Uh, there was a unipolar moment, but it didn't last very long. Uh, today, I think we have a chance at a multipolar world in which there are a number of countries that contribute constructively and positively towards global peace, security, development, and so on and so forth. But uh, but we don't want to go into a Cold War situation with, again, a sort of, uh, uh, you know, bilateral, uh, uh, bipolar world order in which two countries uh, force the rest of the world to uh, taking sides uh, one way or the other. I think that is not in anyone's interest. Uh, and I think uh, it's very important that, uh, that uh, we don't allow that to happen uh, and we don't allow countries to assert themselves in a manner that is to the detriment of other countries. And we have serious issues with, uh, with uh, the way the Belt and Road Initiative has, has been expanded across the world in many senses at the expense of countries that are recipient countries. You've seen some development, but you're paying for everything. And uh, secondly, you know, there are strategic imperatives that go behind Belt and Road. Uh, we have always maintained that there should be freedom of navigation, uh, you know, uh, freedom of skies, uh, you need to ensure that territorial integrity and sovereignty of states are not affected. All of this is not uh, a part of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And China's own actions in funding uh, developing countries uh, has been seen as not being altruistic in nature, but very, very uh, self-centered. And it's a, it's a way of increasing influence and also making sure that your finished goods reach these countries and they are able to extract resources um, and the benefits accruing to these countries have not been uh, very significant uh, in any way. So there are uh, issues out there. Uh, we are very concerned, of course, uh, with, with some of these issues and the Indo-Pacific is, a, is, an, is, a, is a, a part of the world that we look at very closely. We collaborate with other countries to ensure that our principles and our values are the ones that, uh, that uh, are uh, the, and the, those that are recognized by the UN Charter and, and globally continue to prevail in our part of the world. So whether it is, uh, you know, the, uh, it's, it's the Pacific, it's the Atlantic, uh, it's the Indian Ocean, uh, not the Atlantic, Pacific and the Indian Ocean, uh, where they, they, they meet together. Uh, clearly, um, we want to make sure that that is a sphere that uh, of, uh, of uh, an area that continues to be one that is not uh, you know, uh, unduly uh, influenced or, uh, I would say, uh, used by any one country against uh, the sentiment of uh, the rest of the world. Well, like all good things, this meeting has to end because we are limited by time, especially Ambassador Harshring last time. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to Ambassador Harshringla to take time out of his busy schedule to deliver this lecture and address our audience, take care of the question and answer. So highly thankful to you, Ambassador Shringla. Although this is the first time, we do hope this would not be the last time. You will continue to grace our platform in future in various features of this institution. My thanks also to our audience members who are on a Saturday morning in US. And if you are in India, then Saturday evening, taking one hour of time from your weekend, I think that is a lot of time investment. Uh, my heartfelt thanks to Team CSA, people behind the curtain, Mr. Rikudaman Pachauri, Mr. Rajiv Verma, and Ms. Chitkala Akela who helped me organize these programs and do the background work. I really want to thank them. And thank you very much indeed, everyone. And we shall see you next month in our next month's features. Thanks a lot, Ambrev. Thank you, thank you.